Carlson from Topics in Digital Photography. In my previous video, we showed you how to use Adobe Bridge and organize your photos there and how to post-process a photo just using Adobe Camera Raw. In this video, I'm going to show you how to do the same thing we did in Adobe Camera Raw with Adobe Lightroom. And Adobe Camera Raw and Adobe Lightroom basically do the same thing. Lightroom has more organizational capabilities and works differently than Bridge as far as organizing your photos. But when it comes to doing the actual post-processing, the interface is a bit different. But Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom, for the most part, have the same functions. There may be a few things in Lightroom that aren't available in the Adobe Camera Raw. But all the basic functions are there in Adobe Camera Raw. Personally, I like the interface in Lightroom a lot better. And the one thing that Lightroom does that Adobe Camera Raw doesn't do is it keeps track of all the changes you've made and you can revert one level at a time. Adobe Camera Raw, you can always revert back to your original photo in that it is doing non-destructive editing. So with non-destructive editing, instead of making actual changes and saving them to your photo, it's putting a side file in with your photo that makes those changes, and at any point in time, you can revert to the original file. Well, with Lightroom, it's even better. Um, not only can you revert to the original file, but it saves your history even after you've closed out the pro program, and at any point in time, you can go back to any step in your program. At the time when I'm recording this video, I haven't done a video on how to organize things in Lightroom, and it's a little more complicated than Adobe Camera Raw, and I do want this class to be more about photo processing and taking photos than actually organizing your photos. Eventually, I may do a video showing you how to organize your photos in Lightroom, but I will give you some links where you can learn how to organize your photos in Lightroom. But at this point in time, we'll at least show you how to bring Lightroom up and get your photos into Lightroom. Lightroom works a little differently than most programs in that you can't just find your file either on your hard drive or an external drive or a card and open up your photo and work on it. You have to import your photos into Lightroom. I'm going to open Lightroom, and I have a new catalog, so I have nothing in it. Right now, I have nothing in Lightroom, so if you've never worked with Lightroom before, you should have a similar palette. And to get photos into Lightroom, I'm going to have to go to my File menu. Now, you can download the photo that we're going to work on today from eCollege. I've given you the links. And wherever that photo is, you're going to need to make sure you get it into Lightroom. So you're going to go to File up in this corner, Import Photos and Videos. And you're going to have to point Lightroom in the right direction and tell it where to import the photos from. You can see over on the side, it's showing you my local disk. That's where it's going to copy things to. And I'm going to need to go over on this side and tell it where to copy it from. And usually the default is your camera or your card reader. But I've got these photos on my hard drive. So I'm going to click on my disk, users, and I want to get down to my photos. And here's my pictures. And I don't want to import all my pictures. So I don't want to include anything that's in the subfolders. And if you just want to import that one photo that you want to work on in Lightroom, you can uncheck everything that it goes and finds. And then you can just find the photos that you want to work with and check them. But I'm going to check these all and import them at this point and, and show you a couple of things. So let's click Import. And this is going to take a little bit of time. I do have a GPS, so I wouldn't bother with this, but it popped up. I'm just going to enable it. And we're going to let some of these photos come into Lightroom. So I'm going to pause right now. This will take a while. 
Right, I'm back, and I've got a whole bunch of photos in Lightroom now, and I could go down and try to find the photos that I want to work with, and notice that it's got my import right here, and these are all the photos that I just imported. It put those in various folders based on when the pictures were taken. I'm not going to go into how to set up Lightroom at this point. At this point, I don't have a video on how to set up Lightroom, and we're just going to do some basic functions and, and concentrate on processing our picture but i will give you some links i prefer lightroom over adobe camera raw and in fact for the most part i use lightroom more than i do photoshop it's a really good basic editor for your photographs in this particular exercise we're post-processing in lightroom or adobe camera raw they do the same thing there's no point in, in doing both of those and we're going to process the same photo in photoshop there's no law that says that you can't start in Lightroom, post-process your photo, and then just go out and do a little bit in Photoshop, which is what I normally do. All right, so let's look for our photos. And what I want to do is put up text I'm going to look for. And I have Hellier in the name, so I'm going to type that in. H-E-L-Y-A-R. And you can see some photos came up. Uh, and those are the ones I want to work with. And right here we have the one that we worked with. I'll double click on it so you can see it. That's the one that we actually worked with in Adobe Camera Raw. Go back to the grid view I just click on here. If I want to cycle through, I can select the photos I want to cycle through. Or if I just select one, double click, and hit my right or left arrow keys, it'll go to the next photo in there. I can make this full screen by hitting Control shift f Usually I have to hit it a couple times. There we go. And I can cycle through either ones I've selected, or if I didn't select a critical mass, it'll just automatically go to the next photo. Hit Control shift f to bring it back to normal size. If I want to get rid of these menus over here, I can hit the triangle, or you can actually hit tabs. Here's a sort of cheat sheet I've done for Lightroom to show you where everything is. Lightroom works in modules. Right now we're in the library module, and we're going to also work in the development module. You can see these little triangles on the screen. If you click on these triangles, you can hide or reveal the menu. You can also use the tab key to do that. Right now we're in the grid view. If you want to look at a full view of a particular picture, you can either double click on it or you can click on full view. You should have learned how to do most of this in the previous video. Collections are important in Lightroom. They're kind of like a music playlist and they let you group your photos together without moving them on a hard drive. So that can be really useful when you're doing things like class assignments. Let's say we want to go back to our collection. Let's go to the grid view and we can just click on none and it takes out the keywords and just we're on our previous import now i can go and look for photos that i've imported based on when i took the photograph i haven't put that many photos in there but you get the picture so now i've kind of lost track of where the photos i wanted to work with were if i just want to look at the ones i've imported which are the same as all my photographs right now put them up Go back to my text, Hellier's in there already. So in case I move around, I want to be able to find these easily without going up to the keyword. So what I'm going to do is make a collection. Collections are really important because you can group photographs without actually moving them around on your disk. So here's my collection tab. I'm going to hit the plus on that and create collection. Create it and I'll call working files for class create okay you can hit my tab key so that stays in there and for some reason I only put one of those photos in there so now I get need to go back and find the other one so let's go back to my import back to my hellier and I only only need one copy of the fixed one because we will want to compare them later and what I'm going to do is move this file I want to work on down to my collection now when I click on my collection, you'll see I have the two photos there. I can double click and look at the two photos. 
So this is what we came up with when we worked in Adobe Camera Raw. Adobe Camera Raw and Adobe Lightroom basically have the same post-processing tools and you can do the same thing with either one. Let's work with this photo. Right now we're in our library mode. We can do some basic stuff while we're in the library mode. You can see our panel over here that lets us do some editing. But what we really want to do is go into the develop mode. You only have basic functions if you're in the library mode. So I'm in the develop mode and this is the photo I want to work on. Well, before I do that, and I could have done this in library mode as well, I want to make a copy of this because I want to be able to go back and compare what we've done to this original photo. This is a bad photo. It really isn't a good depiction of what I saw that day. It was a pretty sunset, not too many clouds, so not a spectacular sunset, but a really bright, beautiful flower garden. And you can barely see the flowers in this photograph. Well, we're going to bring them out by photoshopping this picture or light rooming, but photoshops become synonymous with changing your photograph. We're going to make this photo look much more like the scene we saw that day than this badly underexposed photo does. You can use Photoshop or Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw or a number of other post-processing programs to fix your photo and make it look more like the scene you actually took a picture of that day. Photoshopping a picture doesn't mean you're making it look unreal. You can, in fact, make it look more real than the actual picture was. I want to make a copy of this photo. One thing about Lightroom is you're going to have to get used to it. It doesn't work the same way that other programs work. And you might find that annoying at first, but if you continue to work with Lightroom, you'll probably start to like it. You can't just copy this photo without exporting it on your hard drive and bringing it back in. But what you can do is you can create a virtual copy, and that's what I'm going to do right now. And I'm going to work on my virtual copy. And if I go back to my library, you'll see that now I do have two different versions of that photo. But there's only one version on my hard drive. So that's nice. It doesn't take up twice the space as it did before. And Lightroom's going to create a side file that stores the visual changes that are being made to the photo. It doesn't actually change the original photo. And we can go back to the original photo at any time. The same is true with Adobe Camera Raw, but the same is not true with Photoshop. With Photoshop, you're actually making changes to your original file. For this reason, when you're editing in Lightroom, it's called non-destructive editing. So let's bring this back into the develop mode, and we'll start working on it. Lightroom's pretty simple. All of our developing tools are contained right in here. So even with one exercise, you can learn most of what you need to learn. Whereas Photoshop's going to take you years to learn to use all of its different tools. When I bring a photo into Lightroom, I usually want to work with getting my exposure and my tone right first. And that's one thing. Lightroom, I move these around and tends to hit things accidentally and, and move my uh, panels around. That can be annoying and I haven't figured out a way around it but it's easy to get back. So the first thing I want to do is work with my tone and my exposure. Up here we have our white balance. This picture doesn't have a problem with white balance, so we're not going to need to use that tool. We will do a lecture where we work with white balance, and I'll explain white balance to you. But if you seem to have a color cast to your photo and it's a little bit off, you can fool around with your temperature here and adjust your white balance. Or if there's something that's kind of a neutral gray in your picture or white, you can just use the eyedropper and click on it. Let's just give that a try right now. We don't really have a neutral gray or white, so this won't change the picture in a good way, but I'll show you. I gave it a blue cast. Well, this is the nice thing about Lightroom. You can go up to Edit, hit Undo. Let's just do it in a different part. You see, now it gave it a purple cast. But it keeps this history over here. If you've made a lot of changes and you decide you want to go way back in time, this history is here and you can just go back so I'm going back to my original copy. All right, if my white balance is all right, usually what I want to do is mess with my exposure and my tone. And I usually start by just hitting that auto button. Just hit my tab key to bring the picture back in with my panels. You can see that did a pretty nice job of making our photo look a lot better. Bringing up the exposure, and I can bring it up more if I want. 
but then it gets washed out looking. When I double click it, it brings it back to the default if I double click the triangle. So let's hit auto again. One thing you can do when you're first learning how to use the program is mess around with the sliders and see what happens. Remember, you can always look at your history and go back. But let's look at our contrast and see what happens if we take it all the way up, in which case we do darken our picture a lot, but we could bring our exposure up more to compensate for that. Then we'll look and see what happens if we bring it all the way down. Again, we want to adjust our exposure the other way to compensate for that. Okay, I'll hit the auto button or go back in here if I want to get back to where I was. This hitting the auto is good. I think I'm going to bring my contrast up just a little bit more. I could bring my exposure up a little bit more, but I'm actually going to fool with my highlights and shadows down here before I think about doing that. When you're messing with these sliders, remember that you're the artist and the final photo should be a representation of your artistic vision. If you want it to represent the scene you saw, that's great. Or you can make it look like something totally different that's more of an artwork type of piece than a photographic representation of the scene. So you're in control. And to a large extent, there's not necessarily a science to exactly where you should put these sliders. It's more about looking at the picture and figuring out what's pleasing to you. The other thing that's nice with Lightroom is that if you fool with all these sliders and changes and get a preset, it's called a preset that you like, you can save that preset and apply it to another picture. So we're not going to get into that today, but that's one of the nice things about Lightroom. And especially if you took a bunch of pictures under the same lighting conditions of similar subjects, it often works to save your presets and apply them to a lot of the other pictures to at least use as a starting point. That's why commercial photographers really like Lightroom. There's no way to do that in Photoshop. So when we're fooling with the highlights and shadows, a lot of photographers of landscapes and especially sunsets and things like that this works well for I like to take these highlights and put them all the way down and the shadows and put them all the way up. I definitely think that putting the shadows all the way up in this underexposed picture works well. And you're not going to want to use these same settings for things like people. Fool them, see what looks good. I think I'm going to bring the highlights back a little bit from all the way, but not that much. And then when we get down to the whites and blacks, there actually is more of a science for setting those. We can look at our histogram up here. And if we look at this histogram right now, we can see it's missing some information to the right. We can mess around with these slides a little bit to get that information back. I'm just fooling with my whites. What I want to do is widen this graph out as much as possible without losing information to the right or to the left. So look at what happens if I put it all the way up. Our highlights start to go off the charts, meaning we've got highlight clipping. And this actually shows you where your highlight clipping is. Double click this to reset it to its default, which is zero. And let's look at the same thing with the blacks. If I pull that over to the left and show the shadow clipping, Notice that everything's going off the graph over here. Okay, so let's double click that. If you double click these arrows, they go to their default. You can look at your histogram and try to set your whites and blacks that way. And I'm just trying not to get, we do have some information at the very bottom here. So probably around here is where I do it based on the histogram. With the blacks maybe over about here. Black clipping isn't as much of a problem, so I think I got a little better look when I went a little over to the left. But there's another way you can do it. Let's double click these and bring them back to zero. If you left click on the triangle and hold down your Alt key, it would be the Alt key if you're working on a PC, which is what I work on, or the Option key if you're working on the Mac, and start sliding your whites over to the right. Watch as I slide them all the way up. You'll start to see some color in the screen, and that tells you that you're starting to clip your highlights. And notice when it goes all the way up, I'm clipping a lot of highlights. So what you want to do is you want to hold that Alt key down, and you want to go just to the point where you're starting to see some pinpoints of light there. It's okay to see a couple of pinpoints or get to your pinpoints and then just back off a touch. And notice that the setting came out to be pretty close to what we did when we were eyeballing the histogram up here. And now let's do the same thing for the black. 
left click, hold it down, take the Alt key, slide over. And with that, I usually slide it to the point. You can see some yellows come in first, just to the point where I start to see some blacks come in. So right about there. I can see our picture looks a lot better already. 